Lokaha Samastaha Sukino Bhavantu This is a Sanskrit peace prayer that wishes for your freedom, liberation, health, and wellness, and for the liberation of all. My name is Susanna Barkataki, and I'm a yoga teacher. And when I thought about coming here, I wanted to bring a prop that could show you that yoga is so much more than just a physical practice. And I wasn't planning on bringing this. <laughs> I have a broken wrist, but I've been practicing yoga through this time. And I want to invite you into sharing a practice with me if you're willing to try it on. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. OK. So first, we're going to just make the sound, ah. Ah. Beautiful. And then, ooh, ooh. And lastly, mmm, like you're savoring something. Mmm. These are the primordial sounds of the universe. Ah, ooh, mmm. Ah represents creation, like when you're beginning something. Ooh, preservation, like that persistence and determination that it takes for you to keep going. And mmm is transformation when you change. So if you're willing to try it together, we'll chant the three sounds all at the same time, ah, ooh, and mm. Because om isn't just like, what's up, omis? It's not just a symbol, <laughs> right? <laughs> or something to put on a t-shirt. It is a sacred sound that comes from my ancestors that represents all creation and the possibility for your and my liberation. So with that energy, I want to invite you to chant the sound, or listen if you prefer not to chant. It's non-denominational, universal sound of creation, preservation, and transformation. And then when we finish, we'll hold silence to just see how it feels in your body. So ground your feet down, lengthen through your spine. You can rest your hands on your legs anywhere that's comfortable. And we'll take a full breath in and out just to clear the channel. Inhale, and full exhale. Inhale for Om. Om. Atta Yoga Anushasanam. This is how Patanjali begins the Yoga Sutras. Yoga is now, right now, is an opportunity to practice yoga. And I know not everyone here or watching is a yoga practitioner. This is my story of reclaiming my roots in a place where I felt like I most didn't belong in a way that changed the yoga system changed how we understand yoga in the West, but most of all, changed me, as well as other practitioners. So I hope that you hear in my story the invitation to reflect on where you may feel like you don't belong, or a place where maybe you're playing small or aren't fully speaking up in your power. Part of why I felt like I didn't belong is because my family moved from the UK to the US. Mixed race, Indian and Pakistani families were experiencing firebombs dropping in the homes of our, our, in our communities. And so we came here, but I landed in hate speech. The boys on my block would say, go home. We don't want you. You have dirty skin. And even called me a terrorist. This was really hard. Those words went in. And on the outside, I'm kind of scrappy, so I actually fought back, like physically fought some of them. Um, <laughs> but inside, 
I started to feel like I had to hide who I was and that who I was, my ancestry, wasn't worthy. Maybe you felt this way. Perhaps there's been a place where you felt like you didn't belong or you weren't able to connect to a group of people that you really wanted to. Luckily, I had the practices of my family to support me. My aunt, my father taught me meditation, yoga, breathing. And I still remember one night after a big fight on the, on the front yard, my dad taught me this visualization practice to help me fall asleep. And if you'd like, you can try it. You can visualize a light, any color that you like, above your head, a ball of light. And he invited me to imagine that ball coming down and everywhere that it flowed and touched in my body, I felt peace and more just ability to breathe, freedom. That night, I fell asleep. And later, I would use this practice as I was finding a way back through all of that internalized oppression and external oppression to take this leap to go to India and connect with my roots. So here you see I'm at the Gandhi Ashram in Warda. And the thing in front of me is a charka, not a chakra. It's a charka, which is a hand-woven loom. Because under British oppression, Indians were forced to farm their own cotton give it to the British, where it was taken to England, produced into undergarments and clothing, and then sold, brought back and sold to Indians at 10 times the cost. So what they did was say, we don't need your clothing. We're going to make our own clothing. So as I was there wearing and learning how to spin khadi cloth, I began to weave and connect to the ancestral tools and teachings of my people. Here you see the ashram observances. These are yoga practices, values like truth, satya, or ahimsa, non-harm. Because non-harm, it's not just what we do when we're caring for ourselves. Ahimsa is interrupting harm wherever we might find it. I came back to the US really excited to share the richness of all that I'd learned. And I went to the local corner yoga studio, but I found that they were more interested in my core than my culture. And the practices that I knew could help so many were nowhere to be found. This studio represents the demographics of the yoga landscape in the US today. According to a Zipia poll and demographics for yoga teachers, 77% of yoga teachers are white in the US. 10% are Latin, 5.7 are black, and 4.1 are Asian. And this is in a practice that for thousands of years has been shared with us from black and brown people. When you look at those statistics, I don't know about you, but I see an institution ripe for transformation and representation. So I was shy, a little less now, I'm still a little shy, <laughs> but I was very, very shy. And at the time I came back and was like, okay, I have to do something about this, but I can't really speak up. I mean, I don't want to go into these yoga studios and be like, okay, I'm here, you know, uh, let me teach your classes. <laughs> So I started to write blogs, and I blogged weekly. And not that many people read my blog. My mom or my best friend would be like, Suzanne, a nice blog every so often. <laughs> but there weren't a lot of, it was mostly crickets. For a year, I kept writing. And then one weekend, I was at my aunt's house, and we were doing a fire ceremony, a puja. And I felt so connected to my ancestors on this land, right? Because yoga is universal. It, didn't come to any one person or people. It came through to all of us. We can all connect to our highest selves. And I was in that place, got home, saw that there was a festival, one I had written to the year before, that was going to be happening in my local community. So I was excited, hopeful, looked online, started to scroll through their lineup. 
and I didn't see anyone that looked like me, my family, or any of the practices that I knew yoga could be. A cry poured from my soul, and I wrote this article called How to Decolonize Your Yoga Practice. Embrace the roots of yoga, cite your sources, practice the full expanse of what yoga is, and bring in representation. I, that night, past midnight, hit publish, kind of off schedule, and shared on social, went to sleep, got up the next day, did my practices, opened my computer. 800 people had shared this article. Thousands had commented and liked it. This was the first time anyone beyond people I knew were reading my words and connecting with my thoughts. I knew at that moment that I wasn't alone. Social change happens like this, right? There's a, a condition or a situation, and then there's a tipping point. And that tipping point can change everything for us or for the conditions we're trying to change. No longer was I going to wait to be asked to join a class or a studio or a festival. It's like, we can create our own festivals. We can create our own workshops, our own classes. And so that was the transformation and the beginning of a movement that is now full of hundreds and thousands of yoga teachers, many of color, of culture, who are sharing the roots of yoga. I created an online summit called Honor, Don't Appropriate Yoga in 2019, and 10,000 people came to this online event. When we speak up in those places where we feel most like alone and vulnerable, Sometimes it gives the space, the invitation for others to speak up to. And so I want to invite you into a practice. Because when I look at this circle, I think about all of the people and all of the things that we share, right? There's so much. Like you're in this room, you're listening to this talk because you've already done so much work on yourself. You're already so like, much more fully expressed. But there might be places that you're still holding back. Maybe rooms that you want to be in. Recently, there was one where I was like, I really want to be there, <laughs> but I didn't get the invite, right? Or things that you want to say that you don't feel quite ready to say. And then that heart at the center, that's even the things that we don't share with ourselves. So in yoga, there's a practice called satya. And satya is speaking your truth, right? It's truth. But it's also listening, listening deeply in such a way that your own truth, that core of you at your heart, or the truth of someone else can come into being. But there's tension between the world we want to see and the world we're in. I did not plan to come up here with a cast on. <laughs> Supposed to come off yesterday, <laughs> right? Even that tension. And so to close, I'd love to invite you, if you'd like, to do a practice with me. And you'll need both your hands. But before you do anything with them, I'd like you to imagine that in one hand, you hold either your mind and in the other your heart, or in one hand, a vision that you're holding for yourself or for the world and the reality. And then with intention, as you're ready, bring your fingertips together to touch. And push there. Hold that tension. Feel it. Yeah. Soften your shoulders. Relax your jaw. Nice. And now tense a little bit. Clench your jaw. Push through your arms, push everything together, pushing really, really hard, like raising the tension, right? What happens when the tension is so high? It can break or collapse or explode. And if you bring your hands back to neutral, your fingers to touch, now 
Soften your arms again, relax, almost too soft. So there's like space between your fingers. And if we're not able to hold the tension, it collapses. But take a breath, connect to your ancestral tools. I've shared mine, yoga. And I invite you to practice yoga as much as you can, as long as you're honoring yoga's roots. <laughs> <laughs> But with your practices, whatever it is that helps you hold the tension, visualize yourself doing that now. And we're holding Hakini Mudra. This is a mudra that also is like a gesture we do in life, right? When we're thinking about something or trying to solve a problem. And when you hold that tension just like this, it invites you into a bridge to a new way. And so you can let your hands rest down Thank you so much for your presence here. I want to close with the way I close all my yoga classes. And it's not namaste. <laughs> Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om Shakti Shakti Shakti. Peace, 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 and power, power, power. Thank you.